The intenders of the highest good are honored to bring you the code. Ten intentions for a better world. We arrived in Ashland, Oregon, intending that we find the perfect place for our Intenders Roadshow. Right away, the Circle of Terran manifested for us. It was the ideal location for a very special group of Intenders to come together. From the moment we got there, we knew we were on sacred ground. It was unforgettable. Join us now as we take you with us on the road with the code. Hello and welcome to the Intenders Road Show. We are here at the Circle of Terran in Ashland, Oregon. And my name is Tony Burroughs and those who know me know that I don't do much of anything without making an intention first. So I'm going to do that now. And I intend that everything needing to be known is known here this day. That all of my words and all of all of our words are clear and precise, uplifting, helpful, and fun. That for each and every one of us here, we are held in the highest light imaginable. And that we are guided, guarded, protected, and connected throughout this entire experience. And that everything we say and do serves the highest, the highest and best good of the universe, ourselves, and everyone everywhere. And so be it. And so, so it is. is. Okay. Hmm. These times we live, so interesting. And I like to liken them to the baking of a cake, where the first thing you do when you bake a cake, you start out by breaking the eggs. <laughs> There's a violent act right there. <laughs> and then you take a bunch of diverse ingredients and you all throw them all in a bowl and you whip the heck out of them. And while you're whipping the heck out of this gooey mess in front of you, it's hard to imagine that anything good could come out of it. And yet with a little time and love in the oven, out comes this beautiful cake for us to enjoy. And I think that's what's going on in this world today. What's going on right now is this, a whole lot of this. And yet with a little time and a little bit of love, out's going to come this magnificent, grand new world for us to enjoy. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, how to go through this as gracefully and easily and effortlessly as possible, because we've been doing these intender circles for some 15 years now. We found out that there's a couple of things that we really need to look at. And the first thing that we really are looking at is that it's wise for us to get proficient at the fine art of manifesting, to get good at it, not just dabble with it or not just play with it, but get good at getting that which we desire to come to us as easily and effortlessly as possible. Because if we do not do that, then we remain at the mercy of people and forces outside ourselves who may not care one iota about us. So getting good at manifesting, getting proficient at it, that seems to be number one. The second thing is, is if we're going to create the peace, the freedom, the joy, the abundance, the grace, and all the good things that we long for and that we deserve, as our right of birth, as being humans on this planet, if we're going to create those things, we need to begin to come together and work together. So that's the spirit with which we started these intender circles, to come together on an empowered basis and get empowered and help each other get empowered so that we can create the world of our choosing, a world that is in support of us, 24-7-365. So, hmm. all this came home to me, started with me actually in the mid-1970s when I had bought a farm in, in uh, Kona in Hawaii and literally retired. I had four and a half acres, avocado farm. Right away when I first got the land there, I realized that I was spending all my time 
with a sickle or a machete or a weed eater or a uh, mower or something because the weeds were encroaching on me as fast as I could cut them down in a rainforest. And so um, the Chinese have a saying, one man, one acre. <laughs> <laughs> I had four and a half steep acres and could not begin to take care of that much land by myself. And so sure enough, I met a man at a party there after I'd been on this land uh, a couple, three months, and the man's name was B.J. And B.J. and I were uh, just uh, playing guitar together at, uh, at a party and got chatting afterwards. And it turned out that he uh, had all the skills that I didn't have because I had been going to school all my life and I didn't know how to fix a truck, build a house, uh, plant a fruit tree, dig a garden, any of those things. And uh, as it turned out, he was somewhat of an expert at these things and was willing to help me with it. Uh, and so he moved up on the property with me and he built a little coffee shack over on one side of the land and I had my little coffee shack over on the other side of the land. And while we were fixing trucks and building houses, we were talking about an interesting body of knowledge that we simply called the information. Mm -hmm. BJ, as it turned out, had been an instructor for a group of people who were in the East San Francisco Bay Area, still are, who call themselves the Morehouse. And the philosophy behind the Morehouse is that they would show you how to get more of whatever it is that you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. So sure enough, as uh, he moved up there and we started uh, working on this property together to make this piece of land, this uh, four and a half steep acres, as as beautiful and productive as it could be, uh, he was also uh, passing along this information to me. And it seemed like whatever challenge or issues or stuff I had going on in my life at any given time, that some facet or another of the information lent itself to me resolving that or getting out of the jam I was in. So for an 18-year period, we had a little mystery school going on there. And B.J. was a very astute, interesting fellow, a master, a true master. And so behind the trees, again, nobody knew what we were doing. We spent these 18 years not only putting this land together, but with him passing along the information. One day, uh, B.J. told me this. Tony, he said, you know, you don't need to go anywhere. He said, everything you need, most of what you want, will come right to you if you believe it. And I said, B.J., I said, you're stark raving crazy. And he said, no, he said, uh, he said, once you get good at using the laws of manifestation, we didn't call it the law of attraction back then, uh, and this was in the mid-70s. Uh, he said, once you get good at using the laws of uh, uh, manifestation, he said, everything will just come to you. You'll manifest it right in front of you. He said, you don't need to go anywhere. You can go out and work the nine to five job and struggle and strive and, and stress and do all those things, but you don't have to. He said, all you have to do is begin to work with these laws of manifestation and everything will come. And I sort of put that on the back burner because I was not ready for it yet. It was too much for me at that time. And so um, let it go, thought, well, this guy's crazy. And, but it wasn't but a couple months later and sure enough, my old Datsun B210 broke down, and so um, I'm hitchhiking again, which back in the, those years on the Big Island uh, was uh, easy. And uh, the job I had with a lady named Audrey up the road, I was doing landscaping for Audrey. She sold her property, moved away, lost my job. My cars broke down at the same time, so sure enough, here I am relegated to stay in home on the property, and I thought, got up one morning, and I thought, well, what a good time to put BJ's ideas to the test. And I did. I just got up one morning and said, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe that everything I need, most of what I want, will come to me. Don't need to go anywhere for it. And you know what? Started working right away. And when I needed Datsun V210 parts, I hear this horn honking down on the road. And uh, I walk down the 600-foot trail to see what's going on. And it's uh, uh, my buddy David Jones and David opens the trunk of his car and it's a trunk load of Datsun B210 parts, which I spent the next four and a half months like a puzzle figuring out how to put together. <laughs> and uh, when I needed uh, food, 
Uh, it would be magically be left at the bottom of the trail, and it wasn't until years later I found out that there was a lady who had an organic vegetable garden uh, who had a surplus of veggies that she was leaving for me there. Uh, and so I never went hungry. And uh, I even remember one night, uh, a full moon night, I'd been lonely and living up in my little hermit uh, coffee shack for uh, months on end. And uh, a lady I had met one time walked up this 600-foot trail under the full moon with a bottle of wine and a pizza and kept me company for the evening. <laughs> and so those kind of things kept happening. And you know what? They still are. Haven't had a regular job in my adult life. I've just been believing it. I've just been believing that whatever I need and most of what I want will come to me. And uh, as we were chopping the trees and as we were fixing the trucks and building the houses, we kept refining this process. And so I was learning the laws of manifestation. Unbeknownst to me, never did I realize that years later after I left the farm in Kona and moved to Hilo and met Tina and Mark and Betsy, would we start the intenders and be working with uh, conscious manifestation uh, in groups of people. But, uh, it was, so I had, a, I had a little bit of a background, BJ in the rainforests of Kona. I'm going to fast forward ahead a little bit and tell you how this thing called the code came to me. Because uh, after we spent many years sitting in intender circles and we wanted to learn more and take it to its next level. And so one day I was uh, helping a friend of mine who was going through her transition. Uh, actually taking care of a lady named Adrian who lived in uh, the Oceano, uh, Arroyo Grande, Pismo Beach area of California. And I was walking along a beach called Grover Beach. And just alone in the morning, about mid-morning, and I realized I'm going to get a download. That's what I call it when the creative juices are coming. And I had the good sense, which I do nowadays when I realize something's coming through, that I'm going to go get quiet and pick up a pencil and piece of paper and start writing. And I did. I ran over into a, 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 some dunes there nestled against a grove of pine trees, closed my eyes, and said my intention, same intention I just started this circle with today. I intended everything needing to be known is known. And I always say that before I do anything creative or talk to a group because I know that what I say is what I get. And I think that's the key to creativity, actually, is to call forth only the highest helpers, the highest uh, guidance. Um, so I'm nestled in between the dunes on Grover Beach, and I close my eyes. And most times, my creative juices flow in the form of words, and I'm just writing them down. But that wasn't the case in this time. This time, a vision came through to me. And the vision, I found myself walking on a country road out in the middle of nowhere. It seemed like Virginia, uh, North Carolina, somewhere on the East Coast, an old logging road. And it was about mid-morning there as well. And the old logging road was overgrown with trees. And uh, nobody around for miles. And you could see the rays of the sun coming through the trees. And uh, as I'm walking down this road, all of a sudden I see a rustling in the bushes up to my right. This is in my vision, in my imagination. And out steps a beautiful Native American man dressed in finely sewn skins, a single eagle feather tied to a single braid, jet black hair, his eyes are glowing. He is just as charismatic as it gets, and I'm attracted to him immediately. And he steps out into the middle of the road, and he asks me sort of a strange question at first. He says, do you stand for the highest good? I said, absolutely. He said, well, then I'll introduce myself. And he tells me that his name is Eagleheart and that he has a story to tell me. And the story goes like this. He says that over 400 years ago, when the white man came to the shores of this continent and with him he brought his violent ways and his sicknesses and many of his tribe were massacred or rubbed out in some way or another. 
And, um, and yet there were a few who had the good sense to duck back into the bushes in order to avoid what was going on in front of them, uh, while most of their fellow tribe members were dying around them. And that those few went back into the forest and they're still there, living in the forests of that area of the country. And that every now and then, they peek out from behind the bushes to see what's going on in our world. And lately, they've been peeking out and they have a few comments they'd like to make because they can see that if we stay along our present path, that we put ourselves at risk. And that's when he gave me the code, the ten intentions of the code. And he asked me if I would like to take a walk into the woods and meet the rest of his tribe. And I did. And what unfolded was the code. We are the Intenders tribe, and you are one of us. You were with us ages ago when we came together and planned the Intenders reunion. As with the hundredth monkey principle, the God spark or the tipping point, the reunion begins when enough people have given up their old ways and opted to line themselves up with the highest good. The last time we met, you helped us design a personal honor code which would guide your people through this time of great change and prepare you for the reunion. We call it the code and it contains 10 principles or intents that you can set. Every time you set an intent, you move all of us one step closer to the day of the reunion. We have returned at this time, just as you requested, to remind you of these things so that you can get ready for the upcoming festivities. The reunion is at hand. The tribe is gathering now. A place is being held in the circle for you we await your return.